Good evening, everyone. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Nicolás. Trabajo con la Biblioteca del Condado de Prince George. My name is Nick. I'm the CEO for Communication and Outreach at the Prince George County Memorial Library System. We're so grateful to a wonderful panel of distinguished artists and also to our very own wonderful council member, Denny Taveras, who is uh, hosting this very special event for Welcoming Week, which is also uh, doubling as a kickoff for Hispanic Heritage Month, because why not celebrate five hours early? And uh, without further ado, we'll turn things over to Council Member Taveras. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for all you're doing here. Uh, um, Prince, like uh, he mentioned, I'm Prince George's County Council Member Denny Taveras. I'm so happy uh, uh, that you are all joining us tonight uh, for this event and the kickoff to Welcoming Week in the county. Uh, Welcoming Week is a national event in which our communities. Uh, like ours, celebrate immigrants and refugees across the country. It is the first year that, we'll, that we're celebrating this event here in Prince George's County, even though we've been uh, a fairly welcoming community all across uh, the board. Um, in addition to this panel, I would encourage you to please check out the other events that we're having uh, with the Prince George's Memorial Library System uh, in current, uh, organizing around this week. And that includes uh, STEM at Home, Prince George's Count, uh, Hi sorry, STEM at Home, Hispanic Science Heroes, on, and that's gonna be on Friday, and Noches de Cuentos, uh, Mayan Weaving, and that will be on Saturday. Uh, we're going to close out the week with a census caravan day event, a day of action event, and that will be on Saturday. Uh, volunteers uh, will be joining me to drive through the most undercounted areas in the county. And uh, we're going to play music, chant, go to door, and help communities get counted. So if you would like to volunteer, and we need volunteers, please, please, please uh, call my office at 301. 9524436 and we will set you up and we will train you and let you know what you need to do. Uh, we also want to take this opportunity to thank the Prince George's Memorial Library System for helping me put on this event, helping us with uh, setting us up electronically and digitally and just for everything that they're doing surrounding um, this particular week and the support that they've given us. Um, now for tonight's event. Uh, we're joined by four amazing local artists uh, who hail, and I know that we don't have four right now, but uh, one of them will soon be joining us, we hope, and um, that hail from different parts of the world and who are incredibly talented. And so we wanted to share a little bit of their stories. And with that, let me just go over a little bit of um, their backgrounds. We have Rafael Rodriguez, who is a painter originally from El Salvador and who is, who is a graduate of our very own uh, Northwestern High School. And he came to the United States in um, 2013 and he first started painting actually in art class in Northwestern. Uh, Rafael has participated in Joe's Movement Emporium's Creative Works um, program and apprenticed at the Art on the Block. Uh, Luis del Valle Peralta is originally from Nicaragua uh, he moved to the D.C. in the 1980s and started out gra doing graffiti murals. Uh, Luis has received num numerous awards for his work, including the East of the River Distinguished Artist Award um, in 2013, and, and he was chosen to create D.C.'s gift to Beijing, China, in their sister city project. Uh, also, Frida Carlo uh, Larios, Sorry, that, that's, a, that's a whole other artist. But Frida Larios, uh, who, Another era. I know, but Tutokaya, sí. named after Frida uh, Carlos. Uh, Frida Larios is also originally from El Salvador and now resides in the DMV region. Much of her work focuses on Maya, Maya, uh, Maya culture, identity, and language, celebrating her indigenous roots. Frida has written a children's book the common, the community buried by an erupting volcano and the new Maya language. Uh, Frida is currently an adjunct professorial lecturer at the American University and at the University of the District of Columbia. And, uh, and even though he is not here yet, hopefully he will be joining us soon. I would like to also include Shah, um, Shaheen Talikhan, 
uh, a painter originally from Azerbaijan, and he has lived in the DC region since 1999. It has a studio right here in Mount Rainier. Uh, Shaheen's paintings prompt reflection on visual perception and his connection to emotion. His works are in the public collections of Baku, Azerbaijan, as well in Washington, DC. And in fact, here locally, if you go to Cesar Chavez Elementary School, he just did that most recent mural, which is amazing. And I would say also for Rafael, who has several amazing paintings in and around the community, like uh, College Park, as well as the Aldi's on Hamilton Street. So I definitely want to make sure that you take the time to visit. So let's start uh, by giving over, yeah. let's, let's give a hand to our esteemed panelists and let's get the question started. Um, and let's start, I guess, with Rafael, but, and this is open for all of you. Um, how did leaving your country of origin change your perception of yourself and home? <laughs> um, first of all, I would like to say thank you to you and everyone who make this possible. Um, so, I don't, leaving my country and coming to the United States, um, I felt like I discovered um, the land of opportunities, as everyone says, uh, says all the time. Um, I, rem I remember that when I was growing up in my country, I didn't have any opportunities. Um, I wanted to continue uh, with school. I wanted to find opportunities, but there was no opportunity. So arriving to the U.S. and seeing so many opportunities that not many young uh, people see in a daily basics um, is such an, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's just like a, like they say, the land is opportunities, but you see opportunities all the time. And so I... You know, I, I didn't used to believe in the education system back home, but now when I came here, I see like going to school, um, you know, getting the education is, is really important. So um, that it just completely changed the way I was thinking before. So that was really important. So, it, so yeah. education came out yeah. as, as, a, as a core uh, value system for you. That's fantastic. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Hey, Frida, do you want to tackle that as well? Uh, I left El Salvador when I, uh, right after the, the signing of the, the peace agreements, and I went to England uh, where I had a scholarship, and that was very far away. <laughs> And different from experience, the experience of being an immigrant, I hope you can hear me well, uh, in, in the United States. So I've been uh, immigrating and migrating uh, for half of my, my, my life uh, after leaving um, uh, El Salvador, uh, uh, after, right after the war. And after being in England, a very cold country in, in every sense, uh, is when I started to look uh, inside and to try and um, tap in my own, um, you know, genetic memory and what 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 was what was I made of in terms of my artistic vein and. Um, I went back to live in Honduras, where I met my husband, who's from half from there, in Copan, in the Mayan side with the Mayan community, Maya Chorti community. Uh, and after that, uh, the um, uh, coup d'etat of the president, uh, what made the situation kind of more uh, hard in Honduras for us to make a living and, and survive and, and so we went to California we, we immigrated to California and then from California to Washington DC to cut it short and um, so uh, it's uh, for me it's been a journey and um, uh, finding a, a home in DC where so many uh, fellow El Salvadorans live has been um, 
uh, beautiful after being uh, so detracted in, in London and different um, places. And then, um, you know, living the, the, the community we were living with, beautiful community in Honduras. So now I find uh, artist friends like Rafael, like uh, Luis, and, uh, you know, who, who I feel close to because, you know, we, we share a, a similar background and a similar, you know, experience of uh, different phenomena. Uh -huh. So, so um, but, but I still, I still, I still, I feel the opposite. I feel like, um, how would you say that uh, uh, the United States is not my home. I don't feel like that. Uh -huh. I always feel like I'm in El Salvador and this is where I, I, I would like to be and would like to die. <laughs> but you know, we are, we are where we are. <laughs> Uh, it, se it seems to me, it seems to me that yeah. uh, that you're still in transition. But one of the things that I see from your from your story is that you're such a risk taker. I mean, well, you see it in all of in all the stories. But the fact that you were able to again and again and again resettle, so I think that that's that's also very unique in your story. And uh, Luis, uh, would you like to? Uh, um, Thank you. That question again, just um, how leaving your country of origin changed your perception of yourself and home. Uh, I left my country when I was about five going on six. Uh, we migrated to the United States. Uh, my parents were teenage parents. One was 14 and the other one was 15. And, you know, uh, uh, they were, uh, Nicaragua was in the civil war between the Contras and the Sandinistas. Um, then they moved to Honduras, and then they saw that the war was so close to there that there was also conflict, I believe, going on in El Salvador around the same time. And they thought that the U.S. was the land of opportunities. This is where they can come and see uh, and, you know, really achieve something. Uh, so we arrived here. We went through Matamoros um, and crossed over to uh, Houston. And... Um, you know, my parents didn't, we didn't know the language. We were first generation. We had to learn, I had to learn English in uh, elementary school. And growing up around like uh, Frida was mentioned, a lot of, most of my friends were from El Salvador. So I barely knew anyone from Nicaragua growing mm -hmm. up, except for a few of my closest friends. And I actually uh, ended up having, you know, since I came here as a child, I actually ended up talking like Salvadorian, you know, with the same accent. So people, a lot of times didn't know I was because uh, there's the, the Nicaraguans have a very distinctive accent, and I lost that. Um, you know, I talk like a Salvadorian. That's and, what my family never, says too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of uh, you know coming here, you know, leaving a uh, very uh, dangerous place like Nicaragua with all the war, going, civil war going on. I ended up coming to D.C. when there was the big crack at the epidemic. Um, in my neighborhood, we had, you know, gangs and drugs were everywhere. We had people that were using drugs in our building. So when I was going to school, I had to jump, you know, like not jump on top of them, but you know, I had to go on top of them and uh, because they were in the stairwells and all that stuff. So, but growing up, all these things didn't seem so foreign. It seemed kind of normal because that's all you know as a, as a child. And as I continued to grow up in that environment, I started seeing that it seems like the negativity in a, in a lot of ways was glorified. And a lot of the music that we we're listening to was very influential in a very negative way. And so I also saw the bad side of what the United States is, but at the same time, I saw it as how people that really want to achieve something big, they can actually do it. You can come from nothing and make something of yourself. So seeing that, um, seeing both pers perspectives also gave me the ability to make choices that uh, got me away from the negative things and more towards the positive. And instead of putting barriers of I'm a victim, I don't have this and I don't have that. Instead, I try to just uh, think about the things that I did have and make the best out of those things. And I think um, I had a lot of, uh, you know, I had a lot of chances to fail, but uh, thank God he always made a way out, a way out for me to be able to uh, get out of those bad situations and really get to where I am today. Um, not with a master plan, but planning one day at a time. 
uh, because I think sometimes we try to focus on, it's good to think about, you know, what you're going to do when you grow up, but a lot of times you have to do, what are you going to do today to survive? So I think a lot of times we have to take one day at a time, uh, thinking about, uh, you know, years from now, but at the same time, focus on, on living the moment so like that you can maximize it. You're on mute. <laughs> Uh, again, I really appreciate what you had to say because it's a really great segue for the next question, which is leaving your native country and settling in a new one often creates a sense of split identity, you know, like um, especially, I don't know, I, I know I saw it a lot in the young ladies, you know, uh, pa parents expect you to be docile, but in America you have to be more assertive and those conflicting, va the conflicting value system that America has versus our, our home countries. And this is true, especially, you see it also in the next generation that's born in the new country. So how, how have you dealt um, in trying to reconcile that split identity? I know you spoke to it a little bit already, Luis, but, um, but how do you uh, uh, reconcile that split identity to your work? And I'll, I'm, I'll ask that question of Rafael and Frida. Yeah. So uh, what I what I do with my work is um, with the kind of like with the different uh, experiences that created the, those different identities. I think I try to channel that through my work, and it kind of makes my work more universal, and it has a wider audience because I'm not just focusing necessarily on Latino culture, but I'm also uh, focusing on Black culture and American culture in general, and uh, being influenced by um, being. Those, all those influences actually make my work more appealing to a broader audience. And I think that sometimes as artists, we try to put ourselves in a niche or like I'm a focused Latino art and I just do Latino art or I just do black art and all I'm going to do is black art. But I like, uh, I like to look at uh, artists like Picasso who actually uh, took influences from uh, not only Spanish culture, but also uh, African culture. And a lot of times it seems like uh, any time that we're doing something, it goes back to the, the or original land of everybody, including white people, which is Africa. Uh, and I think those identities, uh, what I had to do with those different identities or the experiences is actually put them in perspective and see how the different identities are perceived by the different people that I encounter. Uh, because uh, a lot of the things that I grew up saying or the things that I grew up uh, believing in or the things that I grew up uh, being uh, accustomed to, like a, a way of speaking, like a street language, uh, speaking with my black friends or speaking with my Hispanic friends. We all grew up as children, but certain things that I, I grew up with uh, ways of talking, like street slang, I don't use anymore because I see how um, other generations maybe see that as a negative way. So those things that I have obtained uh, through my different experiences, a lot of those things I had to kind of drop and really um, only, only maintain the, the things that really matter the most and that, are, uh, that add value to what I'm doing. No, and I th thank you for that. So um, uh, Rafael, do you, can you speak a little bit of that about the split identity given, especially since you're so still like technically fresh to the country, no? How, how has it been for you in adjusting? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was, uh, I wanted to mention that, um, you know, I'm really new to the country. I am have been here for seven years. So I'm still in the process of, um, uh, you know, how can I put that into my own work so I can, um, you know, make a connection, I guess, with, uh, with my, with the split, uh, identity like um i have been creating work about my experience about the path that i went through when i came to the united states but um as i explore more that um art idea i have been thinking about including more of my work about like how was life back there and how is life here like try, trying to join those um two uh themes together um because I have not figured out how to join those um, two, uh, you know, because those are two separate um, uh, ways of, you know, how people live back there, how I was living back there, and how I'm living back at, at here at this moment. So I'm trying to, how can I include that into my work? Like Luis was saying, how, to, how can I 
make my artwork more that can have more of a how can I say that um, I guess more people like more people can in, identify with my work I guess that's that's the way I want to, to expand that, to expand the 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 the, the coverage or the yeah. access of your work to yeah other, yeah other groups yeah and at the same time uh, you know to the appeal um, yeah yeah so I, I'm still in the process and I'm still thinking about like how can I work with that how can i include that in my work and and i have seen an evolution in the work that you've done from the paintings mm -hmm. um, very focused immigration mm -hmm. the power of the immigrant you mm -hmm. know and and the empowerment that comes with that image yeah. and this transformative uh practice that you now mm -hmm. have going into sculptures like mm -hmm. testing out like testing the waters in different yeah. Uh, um, mediums and and I and I, I I respect that. But uh, Frida, do you want to tackle the identity question, or or do you feel that you're kind of like an ambassador to the world now, or you still see yourself as very much Salvadorian rooted? Uh, you're on mute, Frida. A mute. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Rafa. Um, uh, yeah, when I'm with my students, I, I, I designate a mute manager so that they <laughs> keep telling me, you're on mute, you're on mute. <laughs> anyway, so, um, well, um, yeah, I, I feel in my, in my case, it's been more, um, I, I've, I've honed my identity rather than split it, even though, uh, you know, we we live to, we have to adapt to to a different, um, you know, land traditions and everything. Uh, you still, you know, it, it's what's inside, right? So, but um, with the pandemic, uh, recently, you know, I I like uh, Danny, uh, sorry, Council Member Danny, uh, says, you know, I was traveling more and presenting more of my work. And uh, you know, we we it was interesting that we started doing more, uh, or I started working more in DC. Like um, I had this feeling that now is the time to to connect with this place um, more, right? And uh, kind of also accept that you know that's my home. <laughs> so uh, we started um, with uh, my. Um, colleague and uh, uh, dear friend Musa Suala. Uh, we created a mural at Carlos Rosario uh, International Public School uh, uh, and a half, one and a half years ago. But with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, we went outside because outside was the, a safe space. And also for my two boys uh, who are right now in DC, uh, it was a different experience for them from being in the four walls and you know just being out on the street and learning this the street smart stuff <laughs> was even you know a better learning than uh, maybe the computer learning right so we went out and created started just creating murals a mural where the wooden panels you know the wooden panels that they place for anti-riot right wooden panels so that's how we started and now we're creating like uh, several murals and uh, after that little mural that was kind of that intention of, you know, um, well, first of all, of course, uh, raising our black relatives voices and, you know, supporting that, um, uh, that uh, sorrow. And then uh, also trying to, to, um, to stay to stay in the in in the district uh -huh. creative art and, and, and we just want to remind people that there are black relatives amongst us i mean that there are that there is a black diaspora that went all the way from south america all the way to to canada sure. and, you know so, so we want to make sure that people recognize and and you know throughout europe that that we recognize that there is a diaspora that exists beyond um, the U.S. And so um, I wanna 
I want to ask um, Frida, you've described your new Maya language project as in part an uncovering of your family's racism. Um, can you, and, and, I, and I think that this is also like the conversation that you were just saying with regards to Black Lives Matter, I think that this is also a great nexus for us to build uh, bridges in addition to, I think, I would say a lot of the work that Luis Del Valle does in terms of building bridges across cultures. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's true power in working uh, when we talk about our own family's racism. Can you tell us more about that and how it, it has changed how you viewed your identity today? Um, well, there's different phenomena in El Salvador. Uh, of course, every every country, every region is different, but um, uh, racism was very uh, much embedded for across 200 years uh, because of uh, you know, of course, uh, and the inv invasion, and then um, um, the um, um, loss of communal land, etc., genocides of 32,000 indigenous peoples but in my case my family a uh, uh, one, one side of the family who identifies you know with their afro uh, indigenous descendancy i speak to them a lot since um you know i've been creating uh, indigenous art and and we've been having so many conversations and uh, the more i converse with that side of the family the more i I discover how much uh, racism was in another part of the family who believes, you know, uh, they're, they're white Latinos rather, you know, than having uh, or acknowledging any type of uh, indigenous or Afro-indigenous descent. So, Even though they're totally, uh, they're, they're totally uh, Mayan or indigenous looking or having indig indigenous features. Exactly. Uh huh. So, I mean, there's a larger conversation and this is um, just my small experience because I'm not part of, my family wasn't like that I am aware of. I know there's a lot of trauma on that specific side, but I don't know where it came from. And, um, but there was, uh, you know, other experiences from uh, indigenous communities who who are not uh, mestizo, who were uh, directly affected. So that's not directly my experience, but um, uh, there is uh, all over, you know, El Salvador, the, the denial of, of, of having a, a part of, you know, indigeneity in us. And so what I've, you know, uh, there's other people in the world experiencing this and uh, there's a, a, you know, this, name that is coming around that is called the indigenized indigenous people <laughs> who are the urban people who identify but don't have the the community lived experience of, of a tribe right so um this is this has been for me a, um a wonderful experience because then i'm i'm uh i feel more um i am i feel more secure of my identity you know, not having to explore other uh, identities that I was um, uh, told that, you know, you know, the stories. <laughs> so um, that, that's that been really uh, more powerful uh, to, to explore in my own work and my own, uh, you know, teaching or learning from children and my, you know, my, my books, you know, that I, in which I have always tried to 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 por portray and propagate. Mm -hmm. Oh, shame. Mm -hmm. Okay. Danny, a council member, are, are you are you trying? Are you on mute? No. On me? Yes. I, I am. I am. Shahid, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> I give my third Zoom call today. It's not calculating with me in this computer. I'm so sorry. No, 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 no. Uh, it's okay. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll bring you right on in. Um, uh, I just thank, thank you for, for that response. I, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, Shaheen. 
um, how would you describe your relationship uh, with your current home community and uh, oh. about your native country and how has that relationship changed? So, and, and I put this question towards everybody, but like I used to think, oh, I'm very Dominican. I, I thought to myself, oh, I'm very Dominican. I thought until I went to the Dominican Republic and I was very <laughs> American, you know? And so, uh, so I just, and, and, and not only that, how I'm perceived by Dominicans, how Dominicans no longer see me despite having grown up in a Dominican neighborhood in, by Dominican parents or in a Dominican household by, by teachers and, you know, in an overwhelmingly D Dominican culture. And so I can, I can speak to that and I'm hoping that you'll see, you know, how you view yourself, even though maybe technically some of you may not ha have had the opportunity to go back home yet. Uh, but but how how do you think your relationship or how you see yourself in relation to that to your native country and how you see yourself now in terms of how you've involved how your thinking has evolved how you view yourself differently and we'll start with you Shaheen wow that that's a that's a big big question um, I mean it's interesting there is some parallels and some very big differences. Um, and I love Mount Rainier. I live here from 2007. So out of 20 years in America, 13, I was lived in this art community. And I think it's just great place. I just love this place. And what's interesting is I kind of grew up in a not similar way. We, we didn't have this kind of big city. We had a couple of buildings which were full of artists and we kind of lived there and studios had there. So in that sense, it's, it's not that um, different from uh, experience like almost constantly, you know, interacting with other artists, talking all these, you know, conversations and new interests and projects together. Um, so in that sense, um, I feel like um, almost like, you know, it's how it's supposed to be, right? It's like was at home this way and here. But then it's a huge difference because um, obviously and culturally and, and in the, I mean, when you come here, you meet people from everywhere. You, you meet people and traditions you, you never heard about and you learn about this and it's kind of enriches your outlook to the world. And um, when you kind of go back home, you bring it with you. And obviously um, I'm, I'm trying to share that there, but that's probably for some of my friends, it seems like something really changed about me because you know I, I have this kind of maybe sometimes different ideas about things, which we used to have and uh, things like that. So in that, in that sense, Again, what's similar is kind of seems like this artistic surrounding, and I love it here. I think it's a very great little town. And I think it's really international level art here done in Mount Rainier. It's, it's not just kind of um, local. It's great what it's ours kind of here, but it's not just kind of local event. I think it's something which should be put on the map, uh, on a bigger map, because it is very, very interesting. I mean, you know better than me artists here. And, Margaret, Alonzo, so many names, great artists here. So in that sense, it's very comfortable with a similar kind of continuation of similar surrounding. But then, yes, definitely, I learned a lot of things. I mean, it's a very diverse county. I, I worked this county even when I lived in D.C. first seven years. I actually worked in um, Prince George County. I worked in Sid Pleasant. Um, I was teaching after school program there. So kind of from the very beginning as I came to this country, I was kind of, involved in local, I mean, even when I didn't really thought about it yet as a local, because I was kind of an outsider, really, mostly. But yeah, I, I think it's a kind of great experience. And again, similarities and differences, and we're learning of something new. Uh, we'll, we'll go around, we'll start with, uh, we'll, we'll go on to Luis next. You're, you're on mute. Can you repeat the question? So how you describe your relationship to your home country, to your home community, and what about your native country? How has that relationship changed? Like, do you see yourself still very much, let's say, like Nicaraguan? Like, like what I said, you know, 
that you think you're Nicaraguan, but when you go back, it's like you're you're most definitely like not viewed like that. Like, and 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 you know how how do you see yourself or perceive yourself differently now? Yeah, no, I actually see myself still very Nicaraguan. Uh, my family, every time we get together, we cook in Nicaraguan uh, dishes, um, bigorón, which is fried pork with yuca. So uh, we speak Spanish a lot as well. And but it's funny that when I went to Nicaragua, um, they were, you know, the the funniest thing that happened to me. They'll call me gringo because I speak English, and I'm like, and and I am thinking in my mind, I'm like. When I go to the U.S., the last thing anybody thinks is me being a gringo. But when I was going down there, people think, oh, a gringo, being a gringo. It was so funny to me because I could never see myself that way. And here I am. I come back to the United States. It's like I'm, you know, I'm the farthest thing from my uh, So that was that's something that I think that uh, I've experienced. And it was so funny to me. But even in Nicaragua, we have, uh, um, you know, as you mentioned, there's African, uh, you know, there's the African diaspora. Uh, is all from around the world. So in Nicaragua, we actually have a very uh, good population of Af uh, African uh, descendants. And one of, in one of the areas that we have the most is a uh, place called Bluefield. And uh, in coming here, knowing when you're speaking about race and uh, races in Nicaragua, where someone is black, you're black. But then when you talk about races here in, in you know, and we talk about blacks here in the United States, they differentiate themselves between light skin black and dark skin black and African African black. So it seems like even within the African race, there's divisions within themselves, in which is something that I had to kind of get used to. Not used to it because I still think it, 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 it doesn't make any sense, but it's something that I had to kind of accept that people do all the time. But where you're in Nicaragua uh, and you're black, you're just black, whether you're light skin black or dark, you're just one thing. But it seems like here in the US, people, uh, try to differentiate themselves between different shades of black and who is black or who is light skin. And a lot of times that's something I think that's kind of, um, it has to do with the way that blacks have been oppressed. And it seems that they're trying to find a, uh, it seems like some are just trying to make a shade of black better than another. And that's something that I fully don't agree with. And I really don't understand it because uh, even when we talk about different races, there really is only one, one race, and that is the human race. And it just happens that we all are in different shades of color. So uh, I think racism is something that's very uh, stupid. No, thank you. Uh, Rafael, do you want to tackle that a little bit? Uh, yeah, I want to say a little bit about it. Um, you know, um, I'm fresh to the country, like I said before. Uh, of course, I would feel like I'm Salvadoreño. Um, but as Shaheen was saying that when you come to this country, you come to a place where you see a lot of different cultures, you see a lot of different uh, backgrounds. So um, when you think about going back home, uh, even though I have not been able to go, I think about bringing those ideas, bringing that um, open mind to my country. And I feel like that is not gonna be the same once I go back. So people will see me different. Some people might think that uh, those ideas are not okay back there. So, um, and to me, going back to my country, it would be a lot different because, you know, uh, most of the people that I grew up with, they are, they're gone. They're moved to another place. Uh, or, you know, they moved to a different place, uh, even within the same country. So um, I don't uh, um, I don't know. I don't know about that. Uh, you know, I don't know if I'll feel, I don't know how I feel if I were to go back, but um, you know, being in this, um, in the area of my Rainier, uh, make me feel so welcome. Like I felt, um, I told to some of my mentors before that I felt like I'm a home because the way I talk to them, the way they talk to me. So I feel like I'm a home because I feel like, um, that's how I talk to my people back home. So that's one of the reasons why I feel like I'm a home when I'm here in this amazing community. And, and Shaheen knows I have worked with Shaheen, so Shaheen's, so in, uh, you know, it's one of the art, many artists that I have worked with. So that's that's what makes me feel welcome. And Frida, do you want to tackle this? Uh, be sure it's you're on mute. I lost the, the thread of the question now because. 
was what was the question please just again? describe your relationship to your current home country and um, and what about your native home country and how the relationship has changed over time oh uh, mm -hmm. um well i feel a uh, there's always a, a, a thread uh, running up and down. <laughs> um, I, my father still lives here in El Salvador, so uh, um, I visit um, quite often, almost every three months, because he's he's on his own. So um, I think that that's that's uh, and that's been an opportunity of living in in DC that is kind of close and connected. Uh, and also, well, it's made it also unstable in a way, right? Um, so uh, I feel um, I feel I, like I'm um, I'm rooted to both places in a way because of so, that coming um, so back and forth. Uh -huh. Having having familial roots and having that distinction that's a really good point. Um, I just want to uh, we have yeah. about. Hello. It broke up. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just we it have about it's okay. Go ahead. Fifteen, a little less than fifteen minutes. So I just want to give you, uh, Rafael, um, the floor in asking you how um, having at times uncertain, having had on times uncertain immigration status, changed your relationship to the United States, to Maryland, or Prince George's County. How how having your your situation, um, if you could talk a little bit about that, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> that that's a really uh, kind of tough question, but I will try to answer that. Um, so, you know, before when I first moved to the United States, um, I used to think that, you know, because of the way that I was treated treated in the detention center or by the immigration staff. Um, I was I would always think that people in the country would be the same way, um, and because you know I didn't have documents, I was still the same person that was placed in an detention center, um, and people made and through when I went through the system, I felt like I was a criminal. Um, somehow I felt like um, you know I have committed such a crime, so. I was always thinking that people, uh, once I come into the country, people treat me the same way. Um, but as I learn, learn more about people, as I learned the language, I got to communicate, uh, communicate with people. Um, I also got to tell the story to people, tell my own story. Um, I felt like people were understanding um, my story, they were uh, connecting with my story, so, and I was making more of that connection, so I feel like it changed as I changed my mind, uh, you know, it changed the perspective that I had before, um, even though, I, sorry about that, I'm just switch the camera, so I just knocked the camera off. So, <laughs> sorry about that. So it, I changed, you know, the perfect perspective that I had before. I changed. Um, sorry, I disconnect with <laughs> with this. Uh, but even though I, you know, I went to, I went through being undocumented, and I'm still in the process. Um, I don't think it has changed the way I connect with people in the community here in my Rainier and Maryland. It's just you know, I I believe that there is always a different type of people and people who will understand uh, your story and will understand what you have gone through. And there are also people who want to, even though you're telling them the story, you, they won't understand because they don't want to understand. No, that's a good point. Um, so I want to ask uh, Shaheen um, this particular question. Uh, I mean, even though you all teach, um, uh, uh, Frida and Luis also uh, teach. 
How do you think being a teacher has changed how you approach your work and how has your immigration experience informed your teaching um, or even the perception of the students you teach? It's a, it's a great question. Um, it's very interesting because um, I started teaching uh, in America. So when I came here, obviously, as an artist, nobody really knew me. So um, I couldn't sell much paintings or get some kind of projects. Um, it seemed very kind of avenue, plus I was a uh, good avenue to kind of earn some income, and plus I was learning a language when I came. So I thought that's something good, and I work with kids. Uh, I started working with kids, and I think um, teaching really kind of um, helped me to literally survive in this country in one aspect. So obviously it supported me so I could work and do my own work. But there is different aspect because um, around like 10 years, uh, 13 years ago, um, I started teaching at the Smithsonian and I started teaching this particular course, which was really connected to um, neuroscience and visual perception and things like that. And I think this tremendously changed me as an artist as well. So by teaching this course and kind of gaining this experience working with people and listening feedback, you know, what they really feel, how they see, and learning that as an artist, I mean, it's just um, kind of uh, really um, <clears throat> was great kind of development for me. Immigration status is very interesting because I do think as a, this as a strength. I think in my, in my um, creative work, I can um, incorporate some ideas um, from kind of not necessarily different places because um, America is especially uh, Mount Rainier area and Maryland for me, like, like it's my home now. It's more home than kind of what sometimes I call home. I go back home, it's, I have to put quotes around it really because I live here. So um, yeah, in that sense, uh, you know, I, I kind of feel understand uh, aspects of creative work here in America, but at the same time, I have different outlooks. I have friends in other places, in other countries. So I kind of get influences from there. So in a, in a sense, being an immigrant actually was, I think, uh, plus in my, at least in my experience as an artist, even though it's really difficult in new place to make living, especially when I came, I was 30. So, uh, you know, it's kind of in the almost, it's kind of late, you know, and um, learn everything new and new, new traditions, new tastes, new, new outlooks, new ideas. Um, but I think I gained from it, even if it wasn't easy. No, thank you. We have um i guess do you want to speak uh uh luis and, and frida to that particular question so that given and, and i'll give you each like two minutes before we we wrap it up luis yeah mute please okay frida you can go first if you like ah uh, frida you might want to turn on the light you're like really dark <laughs> I know. It's raining really hard here. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Um, well, in, um, I, I, teach, I began teaching at UDC when I arrived to the United States. Um, I had been teaching before in, even in London after graduating and assisting and, you know, work in different jobs i i i managed to started teaching in my own university and then i i left so after having my two 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 children um it took me like wow like 11 years to get back to teaching which is i know i love teaching since you know i was i, I was been teaching for like uh, maybe 20 years now so uh, well, but I began teaching that the system that you know I created of the uh, regeneration of uh, the colonized iconographics too. So I wrote uh, some little books, etc. In the in the meantime, so um, uh, but coming to DC and teaching at UDC has been a, a, a the mo the, one of the most amazing experiences uh, because I. I can, I'm in a decolonial classroom immediately as I set foot there. I'm in a, um, in a safe space because all my students are, are students of color 
uh, you know, mostly 60% African American, DC native, uh, a lot of Latino uh, students. And so uh, that has been a, a beautiful experience to just arrive and be able to speak freely and, and teach them uh, different worldviews uh, that wouldn't be possible, for example, at American University, where I, I'm, I began teaching this in January. And um, it's a different population. There's still a lot of international students, but um, uh, there's not that, um, you know, it's, it's more, how would you say, a Western uh, standard at American University. But you, 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 you know, one still uh, aims at, um, of course, centering uh, this, uh, 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 perspectives and experiences from uh, BIPOC, you know, BIPOC art, BIPOC design, BIPOC uh, uh, visual symbolism, which is what I teach at American University. Mm -hmm. um, and Luis? Um, with, when it comes to teaching, I'm, uh, I enjoy it very much, but I usually, uh, when I teach, is either in my neighborhood at the Latin American Youth Center, and I enjoy teaching there because I get a chance to uh, interact with some of the youth that have similar experiences to me. And I also like, uh, also I love uh, teaching uh, 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 youth that are in uh, at-risk youth. Um, I work with Luis Cardona with his uh, street outreach program. And I think those students are the ones that I, I can connect to the most and I'm able to uh, really get the most out of. And one of the things that I realized, a lot of these students that sometimes may seem like troubled kids, just really need a, uh, a way to channel their energy in something positive because a lot of this energy, they're just, they're just not having any outlets to do it. And unfortunately, it seems like when I was growing up and getting out of high school, they were eliminating a lot of the arts and music classes. So they left a void in a lot of these young people. So I think that's something that uh, we as students, uh, and I, I would never, I don't consider myself a teacher teacher, but I do love teaching in workshop settings and with either our youth, our youth or some of the youth in my in my community or in my past community. So I think that's the way I can get the most out of them. So we've got basically two, maybe a little bit less than a couple of minutes. Um, so let's let's be really, really brief, but I'll I'll ask this last question is like, what gives you hope or makes you feel excited about the current moment? And uh, I'll kick it off with Rafael because he's the young one. So what gives you hope or makes you feel excited? And we'll go around. I guess um, what gives me hope is that um, my goal is to become a teacher. I want to become an uh, art professor. And I want to, I see the new generations and I want to, you know, I see them so young and I want to one day uh, teach the, the young people about art and about what this moment was about. So I think that's, that's what gives me hope. Okay. Frida, what gives you hope and gets you excited? Um, well, I, I've been hopeful since um, the Black Lives Matters started activating and taking the streets. Yeah, sorry. I know you break up when it, and I can't, well, anyway, so yeah, that's what really is exciting at this moment and that that change uh, is, can only come from, you know, the, the you know, protest, protesting the civil rights. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Thank I also like one more thing, one more thing. I believe that in, in terms of education, children should have uh, the right to to be taught in their own culture, you know, with their own cultural competencies. And that is something I, I dream of to see in the, in the DMV. Mm -hmm. To be, I agree with you a hundred percent that we've got to integrate our, our, our uh, we, we actually, as of right now, we have a, a responsible legacy task force um, effort going on in Prince George's County within 
school system and within the county where we're looking at all places of honor and looking for ways where we could integrate names of prominent individuals throughout the county, replacing some of the names that have had maybe his, historically uh, racist or white supremacist kind of roots and replacing that with more welcoming names. And I think that this is a great opportunity for us to incorporate um, some of the, these Latino leaders in, in Latino areas for so that people can look to these individuals. But uh, that could be a, a whole different conversation. But uh, what gives you hope, Shaheen, and uh, it makes you feel excited? Um, I think something is changing. I mean, um, I'm, I may not know what and how, but I think uh, something is good happening. I mean, in, in, it's, it's not only maybe in this country, it's just in general. And um, yeah, sometimes it feels like it's dark. Sometimes it feels like it's scary, but I think um, there is a good saying, it's maybe cliche a little bit, the darkest hour right before the dawn, right? So I think, I think that's what kind of gives me really hope, but um, people are fundamentally good, good people. We, we will work this out and we will come up with a system which will be fair to everyone and uh, no one will be left behind irrelevant what what money they make and what what their birth rights is or whatever 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 it is those kind of silly artificial kind of um restrictions we put on ourselves i think i think we'll work it out that that's kind of what my belief is no thank you thank you and we'll give you the closing luis uh, uh i think one of the things that you know. is the oh. is the fact that we can uh, have platforms such as this that allows us to speak and be able to uh talk about our experiences and i think this uh, enables people to get closer to what we are and be able to understand us and understand the struggle that we're having and it also gives me hope the last thing is that uh, we have been finding people sometimes that are willing to have dialogue even when you have opposing views and i think that's something that is not happening often even between our, our electoral officials they're not talking to each other and we're lacking communication, but within our community, I see a lot of good communication, even when people don't agree. And I think that's something that we have to get our um, all of our politicians to do as well. But uh, platforms like this, and thank you, uh, Council Member Tavares. Uh, what you're doing now is what gives me hope. Thank you very no, much. Thank you. thank you, thank you, thank you all for joining. I just want to again reiterate. Uh, a big warm thank you and hug to all the people and Nick at the Prince George's uh, County Memorial Library System for basically providing us this platform to be able to hold this event. To everybody who is active um, at, during welcoming week, we wanna just uh, give an amazing uh, shout out to everybody for the upcoming events that they're putting on, uh, which is STEM at Home, Hispanic Science Heroes, and that's gonna be on Friday, and Noche de Cuentos, uh, Mayan Weaving on Saturday, and for everybody who wants to participate in the Day of Action for the Census Caravan, help us make sure that we get everybody counted, and for, for, us, for you to help, uh, you can uh, call my office at 301-952-4436, and um, and I think there was one last thing. Uh, if so, there is uh, Rosaline. Uh, hold on a minute, Rosaline. I think I'm not sure if they asked a question. Uh, just basically say it's all right. Um, to, I guess, be able to learn about our own history. We can't continue to be col uh, colonially schooled in our own land. Uh, and amen to that. And I think that speaks to basically interweaving our, uh, the cultural competency into our school systems. And so I just wanna say again, thank you to everybody and close on that statement and, uh, and Hopefully we could get to do something similar next year uh, and keep, keep on top of welcoming week for, for future events. So thank you so much and happy, happy, happy uh, Hispanic Heritage Month.
Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Nick, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Council well, Member. We really appreciate it, taking time out of your busy schedule to participate in this. I so mm -hmm. gratefully thank you. We want to be able to continue to highlight everything you do. Thank you.